what's up you guys and welcome back to my channel. So I need a couple suggestions from you guys before I jump into today's video. If you remember around Halloween time last year, I did a week of daily videos and I called it Halloween. It was a really awesome time. I felt like I got to expand the type of videos that I did. I even talked about Mount Everest and the morality of it and all of those things. And I did a couple of crimes that happened on Halloween or just crimes that were absolutely bizarre. So I really would love to do that again this year. And I want to know what you guys would like to see. I typically, as you know, try to cover things that haven't been covered over and over and over again. So I already have a couple of ideas, but I really want to hear some from you guys because you guys always manage to find stuff that I've never seen or heard of before. So if you want to see something for Halloween, leave it down below. If you guys see an idea that you like, like the crap out of it so that I can see it. It bumps it closer to the top because I hope to bring you guys daily videos for an entire week that week. I loved it last year. It was so much work, but it honestly was like the best time ever. And I feel like we really got to branch out a lot. So now let's just go ahead and jump right into today's video. So this case is not a very massive one. It's not one with a ton of information. There's not crazy leads and this and that and the other, but it's one that I feel like could be solved easily with the right pushes, which is going to sound crazy because this case is almost 20 years old. I feel like a lot of people see time passing as a bad thing, but for me, I almost view it as more hope because that puts a lot of distance between people that might know something and whoever could be responsible and to me it allows people to come forward now that might not have come forward a long time ago which is why continuing coverage on cases that are this old is so important for me in particular so i will be talking about the disappearance of four-year-old sophia juarez and this actually gained a lot of attention publicly and you'll see why in a little bit but she went missing on February 4th, 2003 from Kennewick, Washington. Sophia was a sweet little four-year-old girl. My daughter's five. The age is a hilarious and very entertaining age. She loved playing with makeup. She loved playing with Barbie dolls. Burger King was like her absolute favorite food. Play is the center of your world at this point in time. And you have a huge imagination but unfortunately, at this young and innocent age, her life was put on pause and we don't know what's happened since then. She lived in a house with a lot of people. Her mother was 20 years old and still lived with her mom and her mom's boyfriend and all the rest of her siblings. So it was a bunch of different people in this one house and she was playing. She was just playing, having a great time in a room from about 8.15 to 9 to 9.15. And around that time, her grandmother's boyfriend was going to head to the store. It was only about five blocks away. It was an easy walk. Uh, and Sophia really, really wanted to go. He left and was not told Sophia was going with him because it was one of those things, if you have kids, you'll get it. It's like one person heads out the door and seconds later, they're like, wait a minute, I want to go too. And so you just slap their shoes on and send them out right after because it's easy for them to catch up. Sophia went to her mom, Maria, asked if she could go. Maria gave her a dollar, tied on her converses for her and sent her out the door because it was just moments after the grandfather had left. So at around 9.45, the grandmother's boyfriend, his name is Jose, he came back from the store, but Sophia wasn't with him. According to Jose, she never caught up to him. He said that he wasn't aware she was coming, so he wasn't really looking for her behind him. She never caught up despite there being such a short time period between him leaving the house and her leaving the house. And he said that even on his way back, he didn't see her. And if she had been following him, she knew where to go from what I've seen. She would have at least ended up there or he would have crossed paths with her on the way back. So this started a very quick and frantic search from everyone in the family. They were checking to make sure she didn't decide to just stay at home. She wasn't in her bedroom. She was nowhere in the house. They were screaming out for her outside and did a pretty quick search of the neighborhood. And Sophia was nowhere to be seen. And this neighborhood is 
just that. It's a fairly simple neighborhood. It has, from what I can see now on Google Maps, almost like warehouses behind it. Um, but there's one decently main road right at the end of their street, but on the other side, it's just a lot more houses and more neighborhoods. After they couldn't find Sophia, Maria finally decided to call authorities and report her daughter as missing. Authorities immediately treated this as an abduction. Now, this is another bit of information where I'm unsure about it. I've only seen it mentioned maybe a handful of times in sources, um, probably for a reason I'll get into, but apparently one of the 10 year old relatives living in the home, I'm assuming it was Maria's brother maybe, he apparently saw Sophia leaving. He saw her walk out of the house just like Maria did, but he saw her walking down the driveway as well. And he said that he saw her walking with a man in a black hoodie, black pants, and black shoes. Now she seemed to be going willingly with this man. So I don't know if he assumed it was Jose. I don't know if it looked like it was Jose, but basically she walked off with this dark figure. Now, because this young man was only 10 years old, they don't tend to take children's um, witness sightings as seriously as they probably should. You never know with kids, they could have a wild imagination. You know, they could you know, think one thing is another thing. Our, their brains work very differently, so it's kind of hard to confirm situations like this. So this sighting wasn't ever confirmed, which is likely why it wasn't on a lot of the sources that I saw. But because this is pretty much all they had to go off of, they ran with it. They ran with the idea of an abduction. And to top it off, Sophia was a very, very shy little girl. She wouldn't even talk to strangers with people she knew present. So according to all of her family, like all across the board, she never would have walked willingly away from the house with someone. Or if she had taken this walk to the store by herself and someone had tried to take her, there would have been at least some sort of scene. So they wanted to look immediately at people that were familiar with her because no one had reported seeing anything strange. Um, it wasn't a weird time of night. Some people likely were in their house winding down, probably putting their kids to sleep, maybe going to sleep themselves. But at the same time, that's kind of a more quiet time. So if something did happen, it would almost set off alarms faster, but no one reported anything. So the first person they really wanted to look at was Jose for obvious reasons. This man isn't technically related to the family. He's only the grandmother's boyfriend and he was supposed to, you know, take her to the store. She couldn't have been that far behind him. You would think maybe she would have called out to him. You know, it just was strange that it was such a short time period, yet somehow he had no clue she was behind him, but they ended up being able to quickly rule out that this was in fact just a miscommunication and he had no idea whatsoever that she was behind him. I'm pretty sure they were able to track him to the store more than likely, track that he was alone. Um, I'm sure security cameras picked all of that up, so he was completely ruled out. Now the next person they wanted to really look into was actually Sophia's father and she had never met him. From what I've seen, he lived in Mexico, so this is kind of a long shot to say the least, but it's not that uncommon for a family member, especially a parent that has had no contact with a child, it's not uncommon for them to suddenly want contact with the child. So a lot of the times they just kind of show up and insert themselves. So this could have been a possibility, but it would have been incredibly coincidental timing. So they got in contact with Sophia's father and he was very, very cooperative the entire time. And just like Jose, they were able to rule him out. Everyone else in the home had been accounted for. They had all remained in the home. There was no sign of a struggle or foul play within the home. Um, all the rest of the members of the family were all accounted for and ruled out pretty quickly. So they had nothing. They were essentially just relying on tips coming in from the public and things like searches. And they ended up getting a call in about a white van. There had apparently been a white van sitting strangely in the neighborhood. Now, it wasn't far at all from Sophia's home and on her road, which I'm sure you've seen at this point through maps, there was kind of like a main-ish road on one side. You had her street and then it almost kind of came to a dead end and you had to go up and around to get into more of the neighborhood. 
So unfortunately, nobody saw the driver of this white van. They weren't even positive this had anything to do with Sophia's disappearance. It was just kind of out of place enough that it raised some sort of alarms. So while they waited for more information on this van, the first ever Amber Alert was put out in Washington state. And then the searches ensued. So the police department, firefighters locally, other firefighter departments, surrounding agencies, volunteers, they all searched a three mile radius around the Juarez home. They knocked on all doors. They even searched inside some of the homes. They brought dogs. They brought dive teams. They brought the National Guard. There was a river relatively close to the home. They had a helicopter that had infrared lights. They brought everything. They left absolutely no stone unturned because this was not a common occurrence at all. And they really concentrated on the neighborhood, again, going off the idea that Sophia more than likely trusted this person that she went off with since there was no sign of a struggle really anywhere. It could have been maybe another older kid in the neighborhood. Maybe it was one of the neighbors. I know they even went through some of the kids' lockers that lived in the neighborhood. While they did a bunch of searches, they did end up stumbling across some things that were thought to possibly belong to Sophia. They ended up finding a pair of children's shoes and overalls, and this kind of made everyone's stomach sink because Sophia was last seen wearing some blue overalls, a red long sleeve shirt, violet socks, white shoes and this pretty much matched but when they brought it to the family the family said that neither of those items actually belonged to Sophia so while they were almost scared to get an answer that it was they almost were also hoping it was so they at least had something to go off of Despite more extensive search efforts other than this, nothing more was found. So there was literally no trace at all of what happened to her. Within one week, however, authorities released to the public that they finally had a person of interest. Sophia had a 35-year-old neighbor that apparently had previous charges for sex crimes. This alone was enough to bring him in for questioning, but to top it off, he apparently called in a very unusual comment about Sophia's disappearance and I'm unsure what comment he made. I'm even unsure who he called it into. I don't know if it was to the family. I don't know if it was to authorities, but it was very bizarre. And on top of that, he also drove a white Ford Tempo, which matched possibly the description of the white car scene kind of lingering near the Juarez home. But they didn't have enough to bring him in to really question him, but luckily they were able to snag him on a completely unrelated traffic charge. And while he was in jail for that, they were able to talk to him. I'm pretty sure they were able to rule him out. They figured out that this call and comment he made was just a sick prank essentially, but they did end up charging him with harassment over the phone for the comment that he made. But that was their first person of interest. It seemed like such a possible lead, but it turned out to be absolutely nothing. Just months later in May, authorities announced to the public that they were still interested in this white van. It might have been a completely different car than the man that they had brought in initially, but they also were looking for another vehicle thanks to another tip that was called in. They were looking for a mid-90s full-sized orange van and apparently the orange paint was incredibly faded in color and the man that was in this car was about 35 to 40 years old he was a white male and he had a blonde very thick and long beard and on the van itself the license plate had two j's in the license plate number but just like the white van authorities had no idea if this orange van actually had anything to do with the disappearance all they had was, I think, one tip that was pointing them in this direction. And again, with the lack of information they had, it was always better safe than sorry to put out this information to the public in case someone else saw something. Authorities continued their search. Again, they searched multiple homes in the area. They questioned over 1,000 people. They chased down every single lead that came in. This is a situation where the entire police department dedicated every 
ounce of their time, resources, and energy to solving a case. This search took them all the way to Mexico. They had some of the craziest leads. They were told that she was hit by a van. They call them like all of her urban legends or myths. You know, people were spreading rumors. She was hit by a van and this person covered it up. She was buried on this like 48 or something acre farm in the middle of nowhere. There were just all of these things that people were coming up with that she was taken by relatives and, you know, taken to Mexico. And they chased every single one down until they were able to rule it out completely. The entire police department, the entire thing, worked on Sophia's case for the first 45 days. That means every single person in the police department was involved in this case. Typically, you get like one or two detectives, maybe a whole unit sometimes. They also even brought in the FBI, but unfortunately, they just were getting nowhere. The public and authorities and her family tried so hard to keep Sophia's name out and her face out there. They ended up putting her face on a NASCAR race car. This man that used to live in the area put her there instead of an ad. They also had her face on semi-trucks through a program called Operation Homebound. She appeared on America's Most Wanted, which brought in a bunch, a bunch of leads. But even as time passed and years went on, they didn't find anything. They continued searches. They kept on chasing leads down and there was just nothing. There was just no evidence. There were just no witnesses. The few people that did call in the strange things that they saw, nothing was ever able to be proven, corroborated. It was heartbreaking. And to make it even more heartbreaking, on January 10th of 2009, Sophia's mother passed away due to health issues. She was only 26 years old. She had just had another baby that was only six months old and she died having no idea at all what happened to her daughter. There have been four separate detectives that have worked on Sophia's case over the years. Every one just as dedicated as the one before them. They're heartbroken for Sophia's family. They're heartbroken that they weren't able to solve it before Sophia's mom's untimely death. I'm pretty sure they cycle out detectives directly working on the case, not because anyone gets bored of it or they just, you know, want to switch people. They do it so that there are fresh eyes. There are thousands and thousands and thousands of reports that have been done on this case. And they're hoping that new eyes can see things that they missed, see a fresh route that they could take, a way that something they did previously could be, you know, redone. Tips still come in to this day, and it's almost been 20 years, and authorities still say this case is incredibly active. This is one of those that they all describe as being so close to home. Even the people that didn't originally work it, if they come into this police department, it's one of the first things that they learn that's important is Sophia's case and bringing Sophia home. The most recent tip that the police department has had was in 2018, they received a tip from someone that found a Sophia Juarez on Facebook living in Long Beach, California. And I think her family was originally from California, moved to Washington, and then a few years after Sophia disappeared, they moved back to California. So a lot of people were wondering if maybe she found her way back as well. This young woman apparently matched the same age that Sophia was. She somewhat matched the age progression. I know that they were waiting to hear back from Long Beach Police Department. I am assuming, however, at this point, since I've seen nothing that it wasn't her, I'm pretty sure that we would know if it was. So it likely was just someone that was living under the same name. I personally have heard this name a few times and that almost makes things that much more difficult. Authorities and the news in the area constantly talk about this case, especially when it comes to the anniversary of her disappearance. Authorities are hoping that with advancement in technology and social media, that they have a better chance at solving this case. I keep trying to record this part and I can't get through it because literally all I picture is my five-year-old daughter. Sophia's case as of 2018, and that's the last that I saw reported and um, I wasn't able to find anything different, but her case is the only open, unsolved, missing child case still on record in Kennewick. Um, 
there's definitely more in Washington, but she's the only one, open and unsolved, almost 20 years later. Now, I know my platform isn't the largest out there, but I do have a decent sized platform and I have hundreds of thousands of incredibly dedicated subscribers and people that feel the same way about these cases that we cover as I do and people that want to help, this case needs your help. You know, this is one of those situations where there's more distance from when it happened. There is probably someone out there that knows something that maybe is far enough away from the person responsible that they are willing to come forward now or it's been so long and it's weighed on them for so long that they want that off of their shoulders. Authorities are confident that someone out there knows at least something, you know, there haven't even been remains stumbled upon, you know, there's information out there. It's just pushing the right buttons and getting it to the right people. This case was so highly publicized at first, so I don't think it was a case of, you know, maybe just the right person didn't know then. I just think it wasn't the right time or the right circumstances for those people to feel safe coming forward maybe. And I'm hoping now with me covering this and you guys sharing her missing persons poster or her story or something that there is renewed interest that maybe something is said a conversation is started again and they can finally have answers for this little girl and her family so many people are invested in her case i was just browsing through some of the online true crime forums and there were people asking are there any updates are there any updates year after year after year there are so many people that wanted to bring this little girl home the entire police department this is one of the most dedicated police departments that i think i've ever really seen on a case her family you know is fighting this fight even though her mom's not here to fight it herself anymore the whole entire public wants to know how this four-year-old disappeared i'm sure that's not a very easy feeling or thing to get through when you have children of your own and you live in this community to know that your child might disappear or this person's still out there that abducted her took her or something it would bring so much closure to so many people to get answers on what happened to Sophia this is one of those cases that I struggle with really hard when it comes to forming an opinion and theories because there's just no information it was late at night and it was dark the grandmother's boyfriend had just left, so she would have only been yards behind him. Plus, the walk itself was so short, I wonder if she maybe went the wrong direction. Maybe she went the right direction to get to the main road and then turned the wrong way. I don't know what store they were planning on going to. All I have is what Google Maps shows me right now. It doesn't even have an option for me to go back in time, which I usually try to go as far back as I can. Um, but once you hit the main road, I mean, there's stores now within about that walking distance, either way you turn down, did she go down the wrong road? You know, at that point, that's the only way I could picture someone maybe snatched her and no one saw if she's walking the opposite direction at this point as her grandmother's boyfriend, he would have been further away. He wouldn't have heard maybe something happen. I don't think whatever happened to her happened to her on that neighborhood road. The houses are pretty close together. They're decently close to the road. I think it's, you know, at that time of night, people again are quieting down and kind of relaxing. I think if there would have been any sort of struggle or anything outside, someone would have heard it. If someone saw a car acting strangely around her disappearance, I'm sure they would have heard something strange happen around the time of her disappearance, but no one has reported that at all. Um, if she again did try to walk to the store on her own, I know now could have been different then. There are multiple different bus stops along the way. That leaves an opportunity for someone to just be kind of hanging around in those locations that she might have passed and it might have been a crime of opportunity. I've seen a lot of different people state that someone had been watching her. This theory I am not as certain of simply because you, if you are a predator and you are trying to abduct a young girl or something like that, first of all, 
you're not going to try to abduct her in the middle of the night because if you've watched her for any period of time, you know how many people are in that house. It's very likely she could have shared a room with somebody. On top of that, you know, if you're not planning on abducting a young girl at night, then why are you going to be there at 9.15 p.m.? You know, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And someone in general that's just preying on young children isn't going to be out at a time where young children typically aren't out. And that kind of leaves this time frame out the window. However, there is that kind of warehouse area that is behind the house. Again, it might not have been there in 2003, but that would be one way someone could have been watching her. Maybe they were working a night shift or something like that happened. Maybe they saw her leave. Maybe they heard something. The back of the house kind of backs up to this warehouse location. But again, I think that's kind of reaching. I don't know what to think. I just want answers for her family, answers for the police department, answers for the public that still worry constantly about her and about their own children. So make sure you guys let me know your theories down below and share this story as much as you can. I don't care if it's my video. I don't care if it's by word of mouth. I don't care if it's by her poster. I just really want to get this case out there as much as I possibly can. When she went missing, she was missing her top four front teeth. Again, she was wearing blue overalls, a red shirt, violet socks, and white shoes. She has a mole under her left eye and a birthmark on her lower back. As always, I have any contact information down below. If you have any information to send in to authorities, there is always Crime Stoppers, which is anonymous. I even put the number here most of the time when I do missing persons cases. So it's something you're seeing the entire time and can jot down real quick. Please be the person that makes the difference. If you are watching this and you know something, even if it's the smallest thing, authorities have worked so hard on this that there could just be a small thing they're missing and they need you to bring it forward. So if you have any information at all, please contact the numbers listed down below. On that note, I'm going to go ahead and go, you guys. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to Sophia's story. And do not forget to hit the subscribe button if you have not already so we can bring them home together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.